I have to always start the recording button. Hey, Sangha, can y'all hear me? Just give me a, a thumbs up that makes up that kind of lets us know that you can kind of hear us and everything sounds okay out there in the ethers. Or someone come off a of mute for me. John or Scott or Ungan. Thank you. Very All right, too. thank you, it's Scott. Loud, clear. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Good morning and God show. Um, we're getting ready to kick off a little bit of a different format. On second Sundays, it's always uh, um, a little bit different. We try to do the community practice. Uh, Chi um, Brian, Ch Ch Chishiki Brian Price used to do the community practice and he's now um, now the head of our board. So he said, so graciously said, let me hand this off to another one of the community members as we are uh, sharing this responsibility and um, being there and servicing the Sangha. So as a part of that, we just kind of talked about what does community practice really look like and what does that feel like? So essentially we wanted to just create a space uh, where our community members can come together to talk about practice, the Dharma, um, and really talk about things that, what does it look like practicing in the real time? So as a part of this, and I transitioned to it, I said, Let, what can we really focus on? And some of the things that came up during our recent retreat were the six perfections. So we, Shinjin Sensei just so happened to do a talk on the six perfections, so everything kind of fell into place. So that worked out beautifully. So over the next like six to eight months, what we'll do is it will take one of the six perfections or uh, the practices of the paramitas really just have a facilitated discussion about what that re what the six perfections are really just give a little bit of an overview of generosity or patience and then you know really get some views from our ancestors hojo sensei um okamura and also we'll be using kind of as a reference point this book called the six perfections buddhism and the cultivation of character by Dell s wright so we'll put all of this information on the website. There is also under teachings on the website, a community practice space. So you'll be able to reference that and also we'll link the talks for, from each of the um, facilitated discussions. So we hope that the community practice space is a place where we talk about our common interests, we share our experiences and we come together to talk about Dharma and what that really looks like in real time or not. Um, so it's not something that we have to all reach a common agreement or understanding on, but it's really a place to have a facilitated discussion within our communities and how we can really relate to the Dharma in real time. So just a little bit of a review of what we'll be doing. Um, the six perfections are, of course, generosity, morality, patience, energy, meditation, and wisdom. And sometimes you'll see wisdom kind of in the center and the others around it, like as like a flower, or you kind of see it uh, in the represented in the garden. And the the things are all the the perfections are all. Let me take this off. This is actually making me sound crazy when I have this. <laughs> so it's it's just a, it's always a different representation online. We have like a, a grid that it has like uh, the, the different perfections coming out kind of circularly from each other. So. Those are essentially what the six perfections are. And again, we'll be referencing, if you really wanna get in depth, we're using this reference by Dale S. Wright. And actually, um, Shinjin Sensei had the same, the book that, of reference um, that he uses as well. And he says it's uh, actually a really excellent um, book. I think so too. So it was just kind of uh, wonderful that we actually use that. So some of the resources that we'll have in support of this is the we'll have the website we'll have the talks uh, actually your talk that you did during the retreat is actually linked there so oh, you know, okay good yeah we'll have that as well as we'll have the the talk links from each of the facilitated discussions we have the book and also hojo sensei actually did a uh, a really nice paper from emory um that he did on the six perfections and the paramitas so i have each of those different under each of the different sections where he actually did a, kind of a really mini dissertation on each of these. So again, it's really an opportunity to kind of spread our wings as a community to figure out and just have a discussion about how this relates in you know person to our precepts. I mean, because in general, how do how, how why are these important really, and why is it such a, a foundational part of our Buddhist teaching? So we'll really um, delve into that and have conversations related to that as well. So just a little bit more on the format. So again, we'll give like a mini overview of what is it. 
and then we'll talk about some historical, you know, from a perspective of our ancestors, what did they say about it? And then we'll go right into it, like upaya, what does that mean from a skillful action or what does that mean in real time for us? So does anybody have any questions kind of on what we're really, you know, here to do and just kind of creating a space for us to have discussions about some of the teachings and some of the stuff that comes up in our, in our practice? Awesome. All right, without further ado, um, we're going to kick this off. Uh, Shinjin Sensei, again, he is a uh, kind of new out of the Hummer, fully transmitted, but he's been around for 25 or more years here. So yeah. uh, we've all, you know, been, a, you know, know him and love him and appreciate him <laughs> kind of stepping uh, well, up you. into um, teaching and spreading the Dharma in, in his unique way. But he's going to, again, kick us off to kind of give us an overview of what the six perfections are. And uh, Shinjin was transmitted in 2020, right during the pandemic. I think that actually is a, a kind of timely uh, perspective of how that works. The Dharma still works even in the midst of uh, everything else that's going on. So let us um, start off by just opening up and let me get the bill. I don't have it's the bill to get us started. We'll do our opening Dharma verses and we'll, Shinjin Sensei will get us kicked off here um, on the path to delving into the six perfections so let's do this. the unsurpassed the profound, profound and, and wondrous, wondrous dharma is, is rarely met with even in a hundred thousand million kalpas, now we exceed in spirit, accept and maintain it. May we unfold the meaning of the Tathagata's truth. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I had a, a, I was just telling a few thoughts uh, that uh, I had a, um, Kind of a stroke of good and simultaneous bad luck in that I misplaced the notebook that had my original talk from the retreat on the parameters. So the bad luck is I couldn't find it and kind of went into a panic. The good luck is, is I used a bunch of different sources and have a, a different perspective on, on the six parameters. So that worked out pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, I, the six parameters are really interesting because they're usually tied to the third noble truth and third noble truth as everybody knows is there's a way out of dukkha there's a way out of suffering and the next fourth noble truth is the eightfold path which is kind of the road map we could consider it the road map as our way out of uh, out of suffering so where did the paramitas come from because you if you go back to the original Pali canon of the buddhist teaching they're not called the six paramitas they're not grouped together virtues are discussed by the buddha but he did not codify the six paramitas so it came afterwards it came afterwards sometime in that that early period and it was originally written down in sanskrit so my guess or what it seems like to me is that the third and fourth noble truths were perplexing enough <laughs> that the original followers of the Buddha for the first few hundred years after after he after he lived and died all were saying things like I, I don't understand this eightfold path what 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 is this what does this mean and the answer by the teachers were well here's how you do it you assume these view, these virtues put these virtues into place assume these virtues and then the eightfold path is going to start to make some sense kind of like Shakespeare, his great quote, assume the virtue. So even if you aren't kind and compassionate, practice being kind and compassionate, and you'll eventually get it. So uh, that's kind of kind of the best historical guess because uh, they're not grouped into a category until much later. And uh, you know, it, even in the earliest writings, they're considered commentary or maybe even footnotes of the Eightfold Path. But the word paramita itself, para, uh, means the highest or the most exaltant, most transcendent, and we use it in uh, 
context of the, the Heart Sutra is gone to the other shore. Gate, gate, paragate. Gone, gone, gone to this other, this other place. So it's transcend, transcendent. Mita is an action. So by saying paramita, we're saying trans, transcendental action. So that kind of begs the question of transcendental of what? Okay, so when we put a prayer paramita into place, we practice a paramita, what is it we're transcending? Well, there's kind of a consensus of commentators all the way back to the, the original times that uh, it's, it's uh, the transcending dualistic or egocentric action and egocentric mindset or non, you know, in attaining non-dualistic and uh, non-ego driven mindset. So it is in a way, it is putting the Eightfold Path in, into practice. It is achieving what's intended in the Eightfold Path, uh, especially the four in the middle, which are how we interact with other people, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Okay, so if we put all of the six parameters into play when we do each of those, you know, that, that kind of makes sense of them. That kind of tells us, well, this is what he means by right. When we say right action, this is a, a right action or one way to look at it. So six parameters, uh, and we'll get into, into, into each of them a little bit, and then we're gonna go deep dives in the future talks. Uh, there's Donna or generosity, Scylla, or morality, Santi or patience, Virya or diligence, Dana or Diana or Jana in the original Pali, concentration, and Prajna or wisdom. Keep in mind in the original presentations of this information and to the current day in the Theravadan tradition, there's 10 parameters. So that's the first thing that happened uh, with the Paramitas when Mahayana became Mahayana and Theravadin became Theravadin. Theravadin also includes skillful means, strength, aspirations, and something they refer to as primordial wisdom. And in, in later talks, we'll probably delve a little bit deeper into those, but I think for right now, since we're just looking at our own tradition, Mahayana, and we're just looking at the basics, they'd probably be very confusing, as if the other six parameters aren't confusing enough as is. Okay, one of the things that, that really struck me is, you know, you've got the original discussions of this information or these ideas in Pali, you have it being written down in Sanskrit, you have extensive commentary in Sanskrit, and then later in Chinese in the sixth and seventh centuries. And you probably had a lot of input from Bactria, as we've talked about in some of the some of the ancestor talks. That uh, there was probably a lot of influence there, uh, and especially possible influence from non-Buddhist uh, sources. So, generosity is probably not exactly right. That's probably not the best translation of the word dana. Uh, I found this this really great uh, definition of dana: willingness to give others what they need without any regret and with no expect no expectation of reward and with joy okay that's 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 a little bit different from you know if you look up miriam and webster generosity is just the quality of kindness and being generous or a willingness to give so that's not exactly the same thing okay so yeah it includes generosity but there's 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 more to it than just generosity and I, my, you know, I can't speak Pali or Sanskrit, but from, from a philosophical slant when I read this, I think that, that altruism is probably a better translation than generosity is. Because if you look at altruism, selfless concern for the well-being of others, or a re recognition slash reconciliation with Jeremy Bentham's uh, idea that was the basis of the British school of utilitarianism is the greatest good for the greatest number. So I, I'm just positing that that may be a closer, a closer idea. And there's a great 
uh, Scottish biologist, uh, Scott Carter Lovejoy. Uh, and in his discussion of natural selection, and forgive me, I'm going to get a little bit in the weeds here, because if you look at the original Darwinian models and Wallace's models of natural selection, it only worked on the individual. You know, the natural selection was a pressure on the individual. Well, Carter Lovejoy in the 60s came up with this idea. He says, no, it's also pressure on the group. And species respond to group pressure. Birds flock, fish school, and that is also a response to natural selection. Well, humans have done the same thing throughout time. We live in groups, and the groups take care of each other. We feed each other, we defend each other. Human babies are born utterly defenseless and would not survive had we not been a, a tribal tribal group. And that's how natural selection has has affected affected human history. So I know you're thinking right now, what does that have to do with Buddhism? Well, if, if a Sangha does not take care of each other, if we don't look after each other, we don't survive. You know, uh, the, one of the three treasures is the community of Buddhism. You know, of course, there, there's, there's, there's time-honored traditions of hermits and people practicing Buddhism all on their own, but, you know, we thank we thank the entire process for three treasures and one of them is community so i, I think another way to, to look at, at donna is not just generosity but how altruistic are we to the to the sangha that we're in and i think that includes generosity because if, if people were not donating money we couldn't keep the doors open and the lights on but cast the net a little wider and think what what is this what does Donna mean to my attitude when I walk in the building? What does Donna mean to how I interact with people? You know, and once once you begin to teach and take on roles here and join the board and things like that, it's like what what does Donna mean to the amount of attention and energy that I'm giving those things? You don't take care of your body. If you don't take care of your mind. If you don't take care of, you know, your family. What does that mean, too? So I really think that's exactly right. What does that really look like? Um, because if you're not if you're neglecting yourself, too, you can't even be there for other people. So what that's, is that overarching? I, I think that's a great, uh, a, a great idea, because one of the things I wrote down in my notes is, however, can you be overly generous? Can you give to the point where you're hurting yourself? And how would that fit into this? And I've got an idea about that too. We'll get there, but uh, thank you for that very, very much. Um, and Scylla has, has always been, you know, its simplest translation has always been morality. And does it really mean morality? And the, the the definition that was given to us in in the in the, the Pali Canon was Sulla means that you follow the Dharma in all aspects, but not without thinking. Okay, that's interesting. And it was it was later amended to say that you're refraining from harm. So Sulla is is kind of I think it's another one of these places where, where we see an illumination of the Eightfold Path. Right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, or how we affect other people. And when we do that right, not right versus wrong, but in balance, we're taking into account how, how those things are affecting other people. We're refraining from harm because we're not engaging in speech that would cause damage. We're not engaging in a livelihood that's actually hurting other people. I don't know if that's the same thing as morality and, and ethics in their, their strictest Western sense, but that's that's the translation we've got. But I think, once again, I think that the concept's a little wider than the basic, uh, basic translation. Uh, Kasanti, the ability not to be perturbed by anything Good luck, but what I, what I think is going on there, I, I think that, uh, you know, patience or endurance, which is the most basic uh, translation that we're given, 
the ability not to be perturbed by anything and you know kind of keep in mind and we've talked about this many many times about what happens to the brain when you sit and if you stick with sitting for a, a long period of time that what happens to the brain is the bonds with the prefrontal cortex get thicker and stronger and the amygdala actually starts to starve and get smaller so by putting effort into sitting one of the things that happens is you develop this nervous uh this this concept in your nervous system called a vagal block that all of the information is not running out of your internal organs into your amygdala and then dumping all of these chemicals that are fight and flight and fear and jealousy and rage and all these very fast fast reactions that the prefrontal cortex is kind of cutting those off at the pass prefrontal cortex is what deals with cause and effect and morality and ethics so this ability not to be perturbed by anything i think what they're driving at is it's the ability to transform the mind into something that is responsive as opposed to reactive and of course you know when these these ideas were originally conceived of and originally written down these guys didn't know what the brain did they didn't know there was any such thing as an amygdala they didn't know what the what the what the what the, the prefrontal cortex did you crack open a skull and they saw a bunch of, of gray goo uh but what they did know is that people that had established long-term sitting practices behaved differently than people who did not and one of the things that happened was is they weren't perturbed by everyday annoying things and this is something we can all put into in, in into our daily life i mean stop for us you know somebody starts annoying us you know either in traffic or in line at the airport or just in you know wherever it may be you know if we stop and consider well you know there there may be reasons they're acting this way that i can't see right in front of me that changes that changes the way you see it and 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 we, we get less perturbed when we do that so I think that's what what Cassante may be driving at. Uh, the next one, Viria energy, is really interesting because the earliest commentary, detailed commentary, comes out of the fifth century in Sri Lanka. And remember, we we talked a bit about Sri Lanka in one of the historical talks uh, about two months ago. Uh, that this may have had a huge amount of influence on Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, some of the writings that came from Sri Lanka that went through Bactria into China. So uh, this may be some, you know, part of a basic concept of Mahayana. And uh, there is a sutra. Uh, the earliest copies are from the 5th century. The Visu Dayama Sutra, and this is the first time I'd ever even heard of this. <laughs> and it describes virya or energy as the state or actions of one who is vigorous. Its manifestation is non-collapse. Just as new, tim new timbers prevent a house from falling or strong reinforcement of troops enables an army to defeat the, energy, inner, the enemy, energy should be regarded as the root of all attainments. I thought that was really interesting because modern commentary on, on, on the Pali on the original language says that, that a better translation of virya uh is is probably spiritual diligence as as opposed to to endurance um but the translation of a lot of poly words and a lot of poly concepts are, are, are still up for debate including including this one but this one one of the things that's really interesting to me uh and i remember Joseph and I having a, a, a long conversation about this a, a couple of years ago is energy alone doesn't mean anything in terms of morality, ethics, or the eightfold path because serial killers are diligent, you know, suicide bombers are diligent. So once again, we've got this idea the same way with the eightfold path, you can't pull one of them out and say, this is the one. This is how it's done. 
they're all intertwined. So I think this is, we can say the exact same thing about the parameters. We're not going to be able to say, okay, it's this. And that's, that's, that's how I'm going to get through this because they're all going to be intertwined. As, as April said a couple of times, she says that wisdom kind of stands apart from the other ones. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in just a minute, but kind of, kind of keep that concept in mind too. Um, Diana is interesting because that's the Sanskrit word. Pali word is jhana, and everybody remembers the etymology of that. Jhana in Chinese is chan. Chan in Japanese is zen. Okay, so we're kind of at this 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 really interesting sort of crossroads, and it's the only one of the paramitas that's described in phases. And there's eight phases, and there's an interesting description uh, from the Pali Canon that jhana is a full body awareness in which the mind becomes very powerful and still, but not frozen, and is able to observe and gain insight into the changing flow of experience. That's interesting. That's a little bit more than just concentration. Uh -huh. Yeah, the jhana is a full-bodied awareness in which the mind becomes very powerful and it's still, but not frozen. And in this is able uh, to observe and gain insight into the changing flow of experience. Okay, so that's, that's, that's like I said, that's a little bit more than just concentration. However, it's divided into eight levels. And the first is the secluded form. The second is the stilled form. The third is fading away, as like physical pain fading away. Uh, and the next is abandoned. And then we get to what are called the formless meditations, which is the fading away of infinite space. Infinite, uh, next is infinite consciousness. The next is nothingness. And then finally, this weird description, dimension of neither perception or non-perception. Okay, so we've got these eight phases that end in neither perception or non-perception. Well, according to another very obscure uh, Sanskrit sutra, the Ariyapa Risa Ana Sutra, which I'd never heard of before I started researching this, uh, the Buddha was actually quoted as saying, this Dharma needs, leads not to disenchantment or dispassion or cessation or stilling or direct knowledge or unabiding, but only to the reappearance in the dimension of neither perception or non-perception. So I left. And allegedly that's, that's a quote from the Buddha. So we know that he left the palace between the time he left the palace and the time of the event of his enlightenment where he started to teach. We know that he wandered around Northern India and Nepal for about seven years. And we know that he took on various practices with various, various teachers and became frustrated with each of them because they couldn't answer the full picture for him of the nature and point to human existence. So what I think may have happened here is he's describing one of those processes with one of his earlier teachers. And his teacher must have said something along the lines of, Jhana is everything. Jhana is the only thing. None of this other stuff matters. And the Buddha's response was, okay, I tried that. I got through these seven levels and the final level led me straight back to this question of the nature of human existence. That's just a guess on my part, but that's, that's what, this, what this real lies. I mean, reads like, okay, I, I, I tried this, I got through this, it too did not work, so I left. And went and forged his own path, had his, had his enlightenment experience under the Bodhi tree, and then came back and said, it's not any of these one things. It's going to be all of them intertwined. 
Okay. So my best guess is John all alone won't cut it. But fast forward uh, almost almost uh, two thousand years, right? Eighteen hundred years, and we have Dogen in 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 China. Dogen comes back to Japan, and one of his primary methods is enlightenment's like a like a big building with a lot of doors and a lot of windows, a lot of ways in, but sitting is the front door. So without I, I think I think that one way to look at this is John alone's not going to do it, but we're not going to get anywhere without it. Okay, so finally, we're at the last one, Prajna Paramita. Uh, and the word that's always used there is wisdom. But actually, what most scholars think now is a better translation is discernment. And uh, from the Tibetan uh, tradition, is a modern commentator, Geshe Tashi uh, Tsering said that what it really means is understanding how things and events exist in terms of their impermanence, in terms of their interdependence, and in terms of their lack of intrinsic existence. Isn't this the basic idea of the Heart Sutra? Okay. So I, I, I think that that's one of the things that the Heart Sutra is trying to uh, illuminate is what exactly do we mean when we say wisdom? Because it starts off with, remember, it starts off with that what Kiteshvara was practicing Prajnaparamita. And then he tries to explain Prajnaparamita to Shariputra. And that's what we chant it, it, with every service. We just did it, you know, an hour ago, 20 minutes, 40 minutes ago, something in that neighborhood. And we went through no ears, no eyes, no tongue, no body, no mind, no concept of, uh, you know, visual information. Uh, you know, nothing in, in reality is, is impermanent and nothing, everything is interdependent. I mean, this is, I think this is the, the meaning of, of Prajna. Uh, in looking at each object and understanding its impermanence, realizing that it is connected to everything else and realizing that without that connection it has no intrinsic existence same goes for ourselves same goes for, for the self but uh as, as we mentioned a few minutes ago that the prajna is typically typically kind of held off to the side from the other five pyramidas and i think that what's happening there if we go back to the very first one we talked to, we go, we, you know, we go back to Donna or generosity. And as April brilliantly described, you can be too generous. You can be generous to the point where you're hurting yourself. Okay. And we kind of went through each of these and, and there is kind of a, 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 a yin and a yang, a plus and a minus to each of these. You, you know, you can go too far and ignore the other ones. John is a perfect example. If you walked into this thinking, well, sitting is everything and the rest of the stuff doesn't matter as long as I keep sitting. Okay, then that doesn't mean you're going to refrain from harm. So, well, a lot of times they get depicted as, you know, the nucleus of the flower and the other paramitas are shown as petals. I think, or, you know, you've heard it like the palm of the hand and the other paramitas are, are fingers and thumb. I think one of the ways that, that it struck me when I was I was researching this, and it struck me when I researched the first pyramid to talk, because I, I can remember mentioning this, that you've got a row of five faucets, and Prajna Pyramid is what determines the correct rate of flow for each of these these faucets. Go too far, and you're going to run out your reserve, or your mix is going to be wrong, or something like that. Don't turn it up enough. You're not you're not practicing this the way it was intended, and becoming a bodhisattva may stay out of your reach. But the prajna paramita is the one that decides. Well, here's how how much of this one we turn on. Here's where we we set this knob so that we are refraining from harm, and that we are looking at each of each of the paramitas and each of the aspects of the eightfold path as as we need them 
So with that, uh, I would like to open the floor and see what everybody else thinks. And uh, as we go the, for the next few months, we're going to be taking a deep dive in each of these uh, each of these paramitas. So it's probably going to be pretty interesting and pretty fun. Yeah, I think so. And again, Sangha, as always, um, this is part of the conversation where actually in the community practice, this is the majority of what we do is have a discussion about what it means. So uh, Shinjin Sensei, thank you so much for giving sure. us that overview. And I, I'm so happy to be able to partner with him um, <laughs> to do this. Um, because it, it does, the wisdom of people that have been practicing is invaluable. Um, we get to leverage the knowledge that they have in real time. And I, one of the things that you said, I think it was about concentration, and it really struck me is you're not having to check your brain at the door. It doesn't mean stuff is not arising, and you don't want to go into being a zombie. You know, it's not that. It does require some, um, some something to work with. It's very active. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's your passively i mean that was a real i'm glad you asked him to reread that so that was really something that struck out in uh what you were reading about related to concentration so and team right. and, and saga please as you please come off of mute questions comments thoughts about um the kind of the format we're open for feedback here but again this is where we want the rubber meets the road what does this really mean in real time like the par meters it is really the six perfections it, it's really something to work with in how we um, relate to our precepts, the eightfold path. It's, nothing stands in a silo of its own. So, again, if you have comments, questions, and Joseph as well, if you have comments or questions, please uh, please pipe up. This is the opportunity. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Pick up the mic for us because that's a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hold it here. Uh, okay. So, kind of my first impression is that this is such a different uh, system than the Judeo-Christian schematic that most of us grew up with, which is you know kind of prohibitive in a way. Don't don't murder. Don't steal. Don't covet the neighbor's wife. So it just seems to be a totally different dynamic than than probably what we were socialized with. You know, I, I imagine that like my tendency would be to project what I was socialized with onto this somehow. Like when we talk about ethics and things like that. Um, but yeah, there, there, the the. the after that, I'd say there seems to be two two parts to it, which is like it, it always comes back to Prajnaparamita because the question is if you could just get to Prajnaparamita, would you even need to focus on these other things? Because would, would they just naturally um, take care of themselves with that discernment? Would you even have to talk about them? Or you know, it's almost like a kid going into a candy store. You know, a kid has to control themselves. As an adult, you you're not might have one piece of candy and that's it you might not have any so i i tend to think of prajna paramita as like the cold fusion reactor of of buddhism you know it's kind of the, the power source and but then it's it also is something that like you don't seem to run into very often either you know so that seems to be the ethics probably most people could crack at a certain point even concentration if you've done enough sitting you know so it, it all seems to kind of lead back to Prajna Paramita and how to crack that. So I guess is the question, do the other five lead to that eventually? That's that's kind of an implication here. I mean, it never comes right out and, and says anything like that, but it, it, it kind of, one of the things that, that, that this seems to kind of like hint at is that these other fives are, are things that you put into practice and you work on. And that the result is you you gain you gain prajnapar you gain wisdom. Um, I, I think if you like sat down and said, "Okay, I'm going to practice being wiser," I don't think you're going to get very far. Um, but it, what you can do is every situation you walk into, you can say, "I'm going to stop and think. Do I need to be more generous with my time and attention here? Do I need to?" put a little bit more endurance into what I'm doing. 
do I need to work a little harder on this this aspect or that aspect? I think you can do things like that. I think that after those periods of, of trial and error, you know, then what you develop is is wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we can kind of take take away. I mean, the Buddha himself left the palace because he was in such turmoil. He didn't walk out 45 minutes later, aha, now I'm enlightened. He went through seven years of trial and error himself. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same with, with Dogen when he went to China. He, he, he didn't like walk into the meditation hall at the Shaolin temple and figure it out immediately. It was a good five years of, of work and concentration and, and trial and error. One follow-up uh, comment. Um, it's, it's intriguing that these, these uh, Theravada texts, these, you know, there's a bit of kind of sometimes looking down on Theravada yeah. uh, by Mahayana, but then the, the, these kind of obscure texts, we don't know all the sutras, how, how many have been lost to the ages, you know? Um, but th they kind of have these pith teachings, you know, just yeah. the, the key elements without yeah. all the, all the um, you know, flash and yeah. bang. Yeah. Um, but I just, it, it raised another question. I was wondering if the, the Abhidharma itself talks about a, achieving these other paramitas? Uh, I came across a lot of references to the Abhidharma. Um, and I don't know enough about that to really answer it other than it gets mentioned a lot in the, in the, the subject of, of, of this discussion of paramitas. Um, but uh, I would have to do a much deeper dive and plan to when we mm -hmm. go through this mm -hmm. uh, to give you a better answer on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, like I said, these ideas go all the way back to the Pali Canon, Pali Canon, canon but it doesn't, they're never, it never comes out and said, these are direct teachings of the Buddha. So I think that, that these were, were added later for people that, that you had a tough time figuring out exactly what the, you know, and I, and that makes perfect, perfect reason because I think, you know, during that period of time, all this information wasn't as easily accessible right. as it is now. I mean, yep. yep. you know, 200 years BC, you're not going to walk down the street and be able to find, you're not, or get on amazon.com, you know, a couple of mouse clicks and this shows up at your house. You know, that wasn't how this was, how this was done, even 25 years right. ago. And I'm glad you brought that up, Joseph. For me, I know um, one thing I'll constantly work with, too, is like, yeah, you're not going to sit down on the cushion and work on wisdom. But again, like you said, this is it's something that arises through the practice. It's kind of like as a byproduct of, the, you know, all the things that we put in, we we have um, we want to work with generosity. We want to. We, we have some natural inquisitiveness that arises that makes us even come to this place to sit. Like, what? Who does that? Who comes to a place and wants to sit at the wall for hours right. and hours? But I mean, it's something that innately that we're connecting with. That I think that you have to be aware of, you know, to even know that to seek. But at the same time, I'm I'm glad that you said that this is something that was developed because people were coming to the Buddha and their teachers like. I, how do you do this? Like, what, what, like, how do you do this? And these are almost like training wheels to kind of get us to kind of things to, that we can use to work with in our day to day lives on like, what does that really look like? Like you said, you can't go, I love the faucet analogy of, you know, it's like filling up a bowl, you have to like, you know, tweak it, you know, or different recipes, but it's going right. to look different for every body, yeah. not going to be the same. In every situation, it could be a totally different thing that arises. But for me, it's important for us not to because we get into that element of wanting to to practice for something and we always come back to we want to practice without grasping or trying to attain something too can you speak a little bit about that because it can roll into that i want to you know practice all these things because i want this you know i want to attain something can you kind of speak because it, 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 i, we, we I kinda, don't think i need to i think you're doing fine i think you should just keep going <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think you've already said it perfectly. I mean, it, it, it uh, you know, I think we we come here with with a certain expectation, and we come here with certain aspirations. And I, I think that the that the deepest, most fundamental aspiration 
people come here with is I, I want the pain to stop. You know, people people that are like healthy and happy and whole typically don't come see Zen Buddhism. It's typically people in turmoil. You know, and I, I think that the most fundamental aspect is I, I want the pain to stop. And and what's making our lives hard and painful is that you know we're hurting others around us. And you know, I think that's that's what most of this is is, is speaking to. Uh, you know that 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 that's the fundamental aspiration. But you know, we can't really aspire to be wiser, but we can aspire to do all the things i want to learn all the techniques that help me stop and think before i act speak and and you know eventually i need i want to be able to control the way my brain is functioning i don't want to be panicked i don't want to be enraged i don't want to be uh you know in these fits of jealousy or or lust i don't want to i don't want to overly attach i mean we can aspire we can aspire to that I think one of the, the things that's really interesting is that, you know, we take the, the four bodhisattva vows. I vow to free all beings. I, I vow to end all delusion. I vow to enter the Dharma gate. I vow to, 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 to ascend to the Buddha way. Out of those four, how many are possible? One. Mm-hmm. I vow to start this path. Mm-hmm. That's, the one thing, that's the one thing you can do. I was listening to a Dharma talk. I can't remember which one. And uh, one of the what the teacher was just like, just just aspire not to make it any worse. Can you just, yeah. can you just do that? Just, just just try not to make it any worse yeah. than it is. Yeah. yeah. Try. Can you can you commit to not causing any harm? Mm-hmm. Refrain from causing any harm. Can you at least do that? In some schools of Theravada, they, they claim that it's not possible to reach Buddhahood anymore because it's a degenerate age. The only possibility is an arhat, which that's the definition of an arhat is uh, someone who um, is not accumulating any more karma, basically. But they, they still are extinguishing their old karma. And I think that's why Mahayana came about because yep. they said, well, that's 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 not going to do it. I mean, this is such an arduous path. Uh, if that's the, I mean, it's a, it's an incredible attainment. But that's where the Bodhisattva vow came about. I, I get what they're saying. Yeah. It's like for most of us in yeah. daily life, just, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. there's no heroic. You know, we're not right. heroic in any way. I right. shouldn't be probably most of the time. But um, I think that's kind of a depressing idea. Not that they were saying that, but I, right. I can see why those those schools. Um, have have kind of fallen by the wayside. Mm-hmm. The, the bodhisattva ideal, because it is heroic, you know, and it is kind of impossible seeming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because I think you're you know you're getting at one of the major differences between Mahayana and Hinayana, and that is that you know Buddhahood, Arhathood, Bodhisattvahood are, are not available to just anybody. You know, and the basic idea of Mahayana is anybody that's willing to do the work that the Buddha did. I'm so glad y'all made the differentiation because I was assuming everybody knew that, but again, I'm glad y'all broke that down. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah. So, anybody out in the ethers, John, Corolla, or Pat, any questions or comments or, yeah, just comments? <laughs> I'm going to see somebody had a comment there. Oh, that was onion. He's having an internet problem. Okay. <laughs> there you go, John. <laughs> Come off mute. Mute. There you go. Sitting, taking it in. Thank you for for this this morning. Nothing comes up to to speak about. Thank you. Just thank you for your presence. We appreciate you always. <laughs> Corolla, anything from the our wise sewing teacher? And I'm so glad you're feeling better. I'm so glad to get your email that you were feeling better. So we're sending you so much energy in your healing. Oh, thank you. I'm doing very well. Um, one thing when I think about the the paramitas 
and in our practice in general is the fact that we are basically monkeys. We are animals and we have that animal nature and dealing with that animal nature, what makes us different from most other animals is the amount of damage we can do. It's not that our great intelligence has gotten us so far because we're We've caused so much damage to each other and to the planet. I, I'm not even sure intelligence is really a, a good thing. But, um, if, if you've read uh, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, his thesis is that all of us are just constructed by genes to, to keep themselves going and to perpetuate their kind. And so the altruism we're talking about starts with kinship groups so that we can um, support people who carry, who share some genes with us. And in our practice, that kinship group extends. And so we have basic altruism to our, our family, and then that spreads out to our community and on from there. But the, the wisdom in this is recognizing what we are and what we have to start with, what we have to work with. And to me, it always comes back to that is, is what does my inner animal want and what do I think about that? I, I think that's a, a really, really brilliant summation. And I, I love that you said, what does my inner animal want and what do I think about that instead of what does my inner animal want and how do I feel about that? Because if you do it that way, it's going to lead you back to the same trap of I want, I need, I'm going to take and take and take and take and keep taking and harm everything around me. I'm going to keep reacting instead of responding. I don't know, Carollo, did that sound like what you were trying to say? Yes, it does sound like what I was trying to say, that, that we have to, that, that the, the real wisdom comes from knowing what we are. And that's part of it. Mm -hmm. That recognizing that in some ways we're no different from the possums and the squirrels and the whales and um, I don't know, I'm singularly inarticulate right now, must be the pain meds, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, we've talked about, you know, the physics that we are made of the stuff from exploding stars. And we can talk about chemistry that we share the same chemicals as the rest of the world. And when you we ramp up a notch, we share the same biology as the rest of creation. Everything is trying to survive. Everything is trying to help their genes survive, if you believe Dawkins, which, and he does make a fairly good argument. And so our practice of doing no harm is, is a basic biological thing. I mean, you don't see herds of cows attacking each other. You, you don't see, you know, within a, a, a species, there isn't really that much conflict, except for, for breeding and, and passing genes along, that we're the only species that's stupid enough to slaughter each other wholesale. and. That's what makes us different, and that what is what we have to deal with. And Pat, I see you come up, open your camera. It's always good to see your beautiful face. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Do you have a Thank comment? You. Thank you. All. Yeah, I'd um, like to go back to, um, I guess you could call it equanimity, and which uh, your practice brings you to the point where you don't 
overreact to anything. And so, and, and I understand that. And I, I'd like to have a little bit more of it. <laughs> but um, I wonder about uh, passion. Is how does that fit into that model or whatever that is, or that re recommendation, that teaching? I kind of know, but I'd like to hear your reaction. Um, well, I would take passion and love out of, out of the group of emotional reactions to things. Because uh, I get asked this every now and then, you know, mm -hmm. if I love someone or if I'm passionate about a certain thing, isn't that attachment? And I, I usually say, I don't think that it is because with attachment, what, one of the things that's happening is that you're demanding a specific outcome. And the, what love is, is, is not that. Love is the highest level of attention that you can pay something. So I think when, you, you know, when you're, you're, you're very passionate about something, in a positive way, what you're able to do is pay that that thing a lot of attention, but not demanding an outcome. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the demand of the outcome is the what what is the turn of the screw that makes it attached. Right. Okay. Did that that's help? Very, that's very helpful. Yeah, because I, I know we're going to have our passions. <laughs> yeah, we all have our passions, but. You know, I, I, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways, that, you know, to kind of kind of illustrate this is, is look at the marriage vows that most people make. Mm -hmm. You know, they you know, they say, I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there and I'm going to help you with everything you need, regardless of what happens. Mm -hmm. That's that is love and passion. I think that attachment would be say, yeah, I'm going to marry you, but you better not gain any weight. <laughs> and you better not go get a haircut that I don't like, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, you better not that. get laid off from work and leave us in financial tough times. That's mm -hmm. attachment. So I think that's that's the difference. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that distinction. Yes. Very helpful. Thank you. I, I want to throw something in there too, because uh, I'm glad you brought that up, um, Pat. Um, it's because it's it's not that you don't have preferences, but it's when the preferences like become crazy. Like when the preferences yeah. or attack you become so attached to preferences that that just kind of jades everything and you can't like can you speak to a little bit about that because it's like if you don't have any reaction or to pat's perspective like love or you know i i, I might like music like bluegrass versus rock sure i mean so is that a bad to have a preference for one I, versus the other because... i don't i don't think so at all i think that the uh, you know well, the only thing I can remember from high school Latin is de gustibus non est disputatum, which is you can't argue with taste. Um, you know, so I, I think that, the, you know, I, preferring bluegrass is one thing. Demanding that nobody else plays bluegrass See. is a different thing. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. You know, demanding that bluegrass does not exist in my realm. That's, you know, or to say I can't function. You know, if I hear bluegrass, I shut down. <laughs> You know, I mean, those are those are different things, right? You know, yeah, but taste it's, itself is, is is a totally different thing. I mean, my case in point, you know, I understand why the Beach Boys are important. I understand why people like the Beach Boys. I I hear a Beach Boys song and I'm like, yeah, that's that's excellent singing. The lyrics are clever, whatever. I don't like the Beach Boys, you know. So it's a different thing. But you know, you go ahead. Leave pet sounds in your CD player for the rest of your life. Um, I think Corolla had her hand up. <laughs> yes. I don't see a, a dichotomy between equanimity and passion. That equanimity means not reacting, while passion is controlled activity. That when you're passionate about something, you you've chosen this particular thing. It's not a reaction to what's going on. So to me, they're they're just uh, two sides of the same coin. Passion is just applying your energy in in a particular direction and not simply um, blind reaction. Yeah. 
That was it helpful? And then John. Sorry. John, you got to come off mute. Okay, thank thank you. Come I'll, off mute unless I'll... you're unless you're singing Beach Boys songs and then stay <laughs> on mute. Uh, I'll get to the Beach Boys. Uh, <laughs> listening to you and and this what's kind of, and I welcome your your uh, response. Equanimity for me allows for preference, i.e. Uh, I prefer chocolate ice cream. Uh, however, vanilla is okay. Uh, that this word attachment seems to carry some pain. Uh, uh, regarding music, uh, I prefer Beatles over the Beach Boys, but I'm equanimous enough. <laughs> I smile <laughs> to be willing to listen to some of your Beach Boys for a while. How's that? <laughs> that's, that's that's well said. But uh, it's that attachment, either to something or against something, that that seems to take me out of equanimity into some something that I'll just label generously. G g generally something that I'd label pain, whether it be a drug. I mean, it, it, if all I can listen to is the Beach Boys or eat, or eat vanilla ice cream and I'm attached to the Beatles and I'm the chocolate, it, it just seems to take me out of equanimity. I guess my bottom line for, for you to respond to is, can I be famous? Can, can I have preferences and still stay within equanimity? It seems like I can, but I, would, I, would I can't do I, that with attachment. I would say absolutely. And I think it's the same thing the Corolla said just a minute ago. And I think it's the same thing April said, you know, I, yeah, I think, I think that that's what, you know, we're, we're definitely in agreement that, you know, having passions, having likes, you know, some preferences is, is not the same as attachment. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know why this is popping in my head, but, um, uh, you know, Dante uh, saw Beatrice only once on a bridge in Venice, and, and most people agree that he never actually spoke to Beatrice. Um, and then they went on to marry other people and have children with other people. And I don't think they ever saw each other again, but his, his passion, whatever she, whatever passion she aroused in Dante, and I don't know if he followed Dante's life, but he was like exiled. He had a death warrant on him for a long time. I mean, he had a rich, full life but he kept this passion whether it was beatrice or the purity or the love that she represented and then he put that obviously into you know the infernal mm -hmm. and uh into all these great master works so in a way his passion brought him equanimity you know his, his passion didn't take him away from it it, mm -hmm. it was like a uh a north star mm -hmm. and then it brought a lot of other people equanimity too because you read these great works a thousand years later you realize, okay, you know, no matter what's going on in my life, how crazy it is that there's this kind of, I have this passion for love and for justice and for whatever it is. So I, I really like that. I really like that. Uh, you know, the only thing that I would add, if, if you weren't passionate, you wouldn't keep showing up here every week, you know, if you were passionate, you wouldn't continue with this, 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 uh, with this practice and that ties into one of the one of the pyramids we just discussed i mean i think that, that that passion you know we'll get you know i think when we when we discuss energy yeah. you know yeah. viria in detail i yeah. think this would be a good time to bring up some of those concepts as well so everybody kind of tuck this away because we're going to talk about it again in a future right. talk well, i think that's that i think that 
it, you nailed that so well. That's a good end point. That's yeah, a, so, so. so does anybody have any last comments and then we'll go ahead and close out? I do. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the Bodhisattva vows are not about enlightening ourselves. They're about getting enlightened enough to where we help enlighten the rest of the world. And that means that we're always going to be out there. We're always going to be vulnerable to, yeah. to pain. We're always going to be vulnerable to disappointment. And that is part of the passion is putting yourself out there and, and taking some risks. Otherwise, you're, you're just, um, as a Tibetan I, I read recently said, otherwise, you're just a paperweight sitting on your cushion. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, to quote the great Bodhisattva Tom Waits, you have to risk something that matters. Nice. Exactly. Yeah. John, did you have something? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for that, Corolla. That's something that uh, it's almost like you're reading my mind this morning. I've been reflecting on exactly that. And, and the reflection comes up like this. What, what can be seen? What can be observed about me when I walk away this morning that somehow will show up in an action? And I love that that image. Otherwise, I'm just a paperweight mm -hmm. sitting here. And, and uh, uh, I, I heard that also from Sensei this morning. A moment ago, you said yes. So thank you all for this uh, affirming and underlying what seems to be so critical that 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 word action. How, how does that leave my office this morning? Where, where does it go? How does it show up? That, that's just something very alive for me at the moment. Well, good. Report, report back when you find out. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go ahead and close out. Before we close out, you know, I got a few little comments. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's, there you go. Um, again, as always, I am just so grateful that we had a lot of participation and it seems like this format will be work will work going forward for our community practice. And again, as always, this community practice information will be listed. The talks will be linked up under the community practice page off of our website. It's under teachings and then community practice. Again, Shinjin Sensei's uh, previous talk and this talk today will be available. Um, upcoming again just for opportunity for practice as always we have our morning and our evening sits we have uh, Fusatsu uh, Raiku Fusatsu tomorrow with Sanshin partnership and upcoming we have uh, for the holidays uh, Hojo Sensei's newly uh, tweaked 108 Dharma Gates New Year's um, evening, evening uh, program that's from 5 to 7 again giving you time to also get home and celebrate with your families as well um, as always um, those of you who are contributing um, to us, we are so grateful for that. Um, whether it's service, um, again, we kicked off with generosity, whether it's your time, your presence, or uh, your financial support, we are so grateful for that. Um, anything else? Can you no. Again, I look forward to working with- I do too, um, it's gonna be fun. Uh, Shinjin Sensei in our community practice discussions. Again, uh, we'll, this format seems to work very well, so we'll get, um, kind of more on page with kind of what that looks like and it, it'll be ever evolving again um joseph could you bring the bell for us and we'll do our closing dharma talks as always we um be safe we are wish to extend the merit again to the folks that were impacted by um the tornadoes um it's in good energy for them and um we'll get ready for our closing verses Beings are numberless. I, I bow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates, Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. 
I vow to realize, realize it. it. Beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible. inexhaustible. I vow to end them. them. Dharma gates are boundless. boundless. I vow vow to enter them. them. The Buddha Buddha way way is unsurpassable. unsurpassable. I I vow vow to realize it. Beings are numberless. (laughs) numberless. I vow vow to free them. them. Delusions Mm -hmm. are inexhaustible. inexhaustible. I vow vow to win them. them. Dharma gates are boundless. boundless. I vow vow to enter them. them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. unsurpassable. I vow vow to realize realize it. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a safe week.